very warm welcome to all of you. Christ is risen. Truly, Truly he is risen. So we've celebrated Vespers and I'm glad that we've been able to pray together before we have this talk. Because we've seen icons in their natural habitat um, in, within the context of Orthodox worship. We're blessed this evening to have with us Father Justin Venn, the face and the name behind Studio Sanctus, if anybody has seen that name up and batting around on Facebook. Father Justin is an Orthodox priest, as you can probably tell, um, who for the past two years has served the parish of St Elizabeth the New Martyr in Wallasey over on the Wirral. Um, some of you will know that's my old parish, where I have many fond memories, although our time didn't overlap. Um, so Father Justin is a new friend to our parish and we're very, very glad to be able to welcome him. In addition to his priestly ministry, or Father Justin might prefer to say as part of his priestly ministry, he also helps people to enter into communion with God through iconography, through the holy images that are used to focus our devotion and to act as windows into heaven. Father Justin works in natural pigments, in paint, in wood, in mosaic, and his work can be seen, or some of it here, um, also in various churches and in private homes. His work extends beyond individual icons, such as those we see here this evening, as he is also responsible for the beautification of the entire interior of St Andrew's Orthodox Church in Johannesburg, back in his native South Africa. With such a wealth of artistic ability, accompanied by the spirituality that nourishes it, I have no doubt that Father Justin has much wisdom to offer, and we are blessed and we are privileged to sample something of that tonight. Father Justin. Thank you. That was a very flattering introduction. <laughs> I'll have to live up to that now. Um, anyway, thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. Thanks for inviting me. It's lovely. I'm very happy to be here. Thank you all for coming. Um, I'm sure you didn't come just for me, but it's <laughs> lovely to be here and to participate and uh, uh, to witness your worship a little bit. Um, very different from what I'm used to, but very pleasant. Very, very pleasant. And I'm happy to share a little bit of our side. I mean, iconography, I know, is also part of the entire church's tradition, but it's been lost in various places along the way. So I'm happy to share what I know and my experience of the iconographic tradition with you all. Um, now, before I, before I came to prepare this, I said to uh, Father Cyprian, I said, well, what shall I talk about? What do they want to know about? And he sort of paused for a moment and said, well, whatever. <laughs> he said, whatever you think. What do you think they would want to hear? So, I think I thought about it for a moment and I thought, I'm just going to give you a general overview <laughs> because there is so much I could say. That, you know, I could tackle one tiny little topic about iconography and we could spend three hours talking about that tiny little corner of iconography. But I think what's more beneficial is if we just go through what it is, how it came about, how it fits into the worship, um, where are we at the moment with iconography in the church? Little things like that. And I'm not going to keep you for very long, um, but I, you know, once I do get talking, it's so I don't know, somebody stop me up and I'm a bit long. <laughs> <laughs> but I won't try to get too in-depth. Um, so anyway, so let's start. All right. First things first, what is icon? What is an icon? Okay, people already at that point start to get a little bit confused. <laughs> because icon, the way we use it in uh, English now, or in modern languages, the icon is sort of, it sounds, it sounds like a, you know, something that's been held up. Right, some, some, some iconic figure, like Elvis, right? He's an icon of rock music, something like that. And the word has gotten sort of a little bit lost along the way. Whereas it really just means image, right? In Greek, icon just means image. And that's it, it's simple. It just means image. It even gets lost along the way when you use the word icon in church because we tend to think of one type of icon, this style or that style. And it gets very confusing because in the church there's so many different types of icons, so many different types of styles, and you say, well, which one is an icon and which one isn't an icon? If you keep in mind that icon just means image, you understand that any kind of holy image is an icon. Okay? It just has to be an image, an image of God, His Mother, the saints, various uh, uh, feasts and events that relate to our uh, plan of salvation, right? relate to the gospel. Those things all can be classified as <coughs> icons. There's a story, a sort of a legend, 
that comes about, <clears throat> it's during the life of Christ. You know? I mean, this isn't recorded anywhere officially, but it's just sort of one of these legends. That during the time that Christ was here, uh, there was a king in, oh, I suppose, somewhere towards Persia or somewhere uh, further east, King Abgar, and uh, he had some kind of skin disease. And he had heard about this miracle worker from Galilee who was going around Judea and performing all of these miracles, and he thought, well, if I can get him to come over to me, he'll be able to heal me of this disease. And so he sent sort of a delegation over there, and Christ said, well, I can't, I'm busy. <laughs> I can't come over there to heal him, sorry. And the delegation said, well, he thought you might say that, so he said, if we can paint a picture of you, he believes that if he can just take that picture back and he can look at you, let's see what you look at, look at your face, he will be healed just by looking. And so the artist tried to reproduce the face of Christ, he tried to draw a picture of Christ, or paint a picture of Christ, but it was so radiant that he simply couldn't capture this image, he couldn't get it right. And so Christ took a cloth and put his, uh, put his face into the cloth, and when he took it off, his face was printed in the cloth, there was an image of his face printed in the cloth. And he gave this to the servant, and the servant took it back to King Abgar, and the king looked upon it, and he was healed. And we call this image, and it's actually this here, we call this the Holy Mandelion. Mandelion in Greek just means napkin, right? It means a cloth. And you see, this is the image, they call it the image not made with hands. Okay, so this is stylized, but you see, this is the cloth. Those are the little tassels on the end of the cloth. Okay, I mean, I've, you know, there's so many different ways that you can do this image, but if you ever see just a face of Christ, and if you look in the background, you see some kind of a sort of cloth or a napkin, you know, that's the mandilion. And that's the icon that comes from this story. So, very strictly speaking, you could say that that was the first icon ever made. And we even call that icon the image not made with hands. Right? So, if we really want to trace the beginning of iconography, we can say it starts with that. But fine, it's a legend. When we want to come to actual real things that we can see now, we can take photographs of, <coughs> the next best thing is the catacombs, right? all the catacomb churches. During the time that Christianity was persecuted in the very early centuries, there were many churches underground, and there naturally people started to depict events from the Old Testament mostly that they would relate to Christ and the life of Christ. So you see a lot of symbolism. You know, before we see outright images, outright uh, you know, the paintings or the, the, the visages of faith uh, of Christ as mother and saints, we see a sort of symbolism. It's still images, it's still icons, but they are images of a deeper reality. So, for instance, you'll see an image, a painting of Jonah and the whale, or Jonah and the fish, however you want to say it. And that's an image of Christ's three days in the tomb and resurrection. You'll see an icon, a painting of Moses crossing the Red Sea, and that for the early Christians was an image, right, an icon of uh, baptism, right, as we are washed away, uh, you know, all our sins are washed away in the water and come to a new life. And this is really the beginning. This is this Old Testament sort of transition into the New Testament era, the Gospel era, and how they understood this visually. Very soon after that, we start to get the actual image of Christ. Now, during Christ's lifetime, we don't know, aside from this legend of the napkin, what he actually looked like. Nobody knows what he actually looked like, right? But you have a tradition that starts. And, you know, it kind of goes up and down, and especially in the West, Christ was often depicted without a beard. He was a fairly young man without a beard. In the East, he almost always had a beard and sort of longish hair. Now, did he actually look like that? We don't know. We just don't know what Christ looked like. But it doesn't matter. It's completely besides the point what he looked like. What's important is that we've settled on an image that we understand to be Christ. And that that image becomes a tradition. And for that reason, I can look at a Christ from the catacombs, and I can look at a Christ from 16th century Moscow, and I can recognize that it's the same person. I don't even need to see that ICXE, which I'll explain in a moment, the inscription on the name. Oh, sorry, it's in front of me here. I don't need to see that. You know, because I know that look, I know that face, and everybody recognizes that. And the same thing happened very soon for the saints. Everybody can recognize the Saint Paul. Everyone can recognize the Saint Peter because there is a tradition of the way they look. Okay, the type of beard, the type of hair, the color, the, the garments they're wearing, whatever the case is. 
and that has gone, has, uh, has continued through the centuries. The style changes, the image can change, but what's actually really depicted is consistent. When we break with that, that's when the tradition starts to crumble. Okay, and that's when you start to say, well, is it still the icon? So for instance, an image of Christ as an American Indian. Just because it says Christ, <laughs> it doesn't mean that it's Christ anymore. Because this icon has broken down, this image has broken down, this tradition has broken down somewhere along the line. Okay, for that reason, there's a consistency in orthodoxy. There's a consistency within the church of how Christ, his mother, and the saints are depicted. Okay, so this is the very beginnings of development of what we come to call the icon, right? <clears throat> now, now, we have those early centuries, right? The Christian church is underground. Then suddenly, we don't have persecution anymore. Church becomes mainstream religion. Then there's a flourishing of iconography. Everything's wonderful, building churches. And then we go through a massive dip again, right? We go through this period of iconoclasm. Okay? Iconoclasm means smashing of images. Now, for this reason, they, well, I'll explain what happened <clears throat> briefly. So what happened was basically, we still don't know today either. My bet is it's actually more political than anything else, but there was a Byzantine, Byzantine emperor. I say Byzantine, I don't know, people always correct me and say it's Byzantine, but I say Byzantine. <laughs> Anyway, there's the Byzantine Emperor Leo, okay, and he, for some reason, we don't exactly know why, I think it was political more than religious, he started this movement of iconoclasm to basically destroy icons, okay, and quite violently. I mean, they would rip icons off the walls, they would paint over them, they would, you know, uh, break up paintings, they would break up mosaics. It got so bad they would even kill people who were painting icons, right, or chop their hands off. This is how bad it got. And for that reason, we actually don't have a lot of icons from before that period. The first bout of the iconoclasm, because it happened twice, twice, was from the year 726 to 787. So that's quite, a long, that's quite a long period of iconoclasm. So the church went through a real dip with imagery at that point. And it fell back, almost all the way back to what it was in the catacombs, where we just went back to symbolism, right? We just understood the cross as a symbol, for instance, or again, things like the Old Testament, depictions of what happened to the Old Testament. <clears throat> and for that reason, it's a pity we don't really have a lot that we can compare from those uh, first sort of uh, six centuries. Anyway, <clears throat> then we had this bout of iconoclasm, right? The church went through ups and downs, they helped, they brought a council together, they established the theology of the icon, because until then, there wasn't any need to establish a theology of the icon. It was something instinctive for the church that they would have an image before them. Okay? It's a very Protestant type of thing to believe that we could worship without any kind of material, with any kind of matter. You know, and I know a lot of people cr criticize the Orthodox Church for the smells and bells, you know, all the frills, the incense and the vestments and you know, the music and all these wonderful things. But all of these things are what make up human life. You know? All of these things are what we participate in. And so for our worship, it's natural that we participate in these things physically. And so for these early people, these early Christians, it was natural that they would have these images around them, that they would create the image of Christ, create the image of the saints in front of them, that they would be able to worship with them in a way. I'll explain a little bit more theology in a second. But in any case, so they had to have this, these councils to develop this, this theology. Then it came to a sort of end, like I said, around 787. It was ironically Leo's wife, right, the, Empress, the emperor's wife, Irene, Irini, who brought an end to it. Okay, she somehow, he, he passed away and then she calmed things down, re-established orthodoxy, everyone's happy again, venerating icons. And then another bout of iconoclasm comes. And this time, by another Byzantine emperor, also called Leo, this bout was from 814 to 842, so again, a fairly large chunk. And it was ended by his wife, <laughs> Again, the emperor's wife, after he had died, and her name was Theodora. So it was two bouts of iconoclasm. Both of them started by an emperor called Leo, and both of them ended by their respective wives. And during that time, like I just said, there was this council, which we call the Seventh Ecumenical Council. The councils mean a time when all of the churches gathered together, you know, with 
representatives from all the different churches come together to discuss a theological problem and to come up with, you know, what, what does the Orthodox Church understand? What does the Church understand? What is what is Christ delivered to us? Because you have to understand the Orthodox Church doesn't just wander around making theology for fun. We're quite happy just to leave things as they are, just to accept the faith as Christ gave it to us. But when there is a challenge to the tradition that we've received, then theology comes. Then we have to develop dogma. The word dogma in uh, Greek is a barrier. Like when you know you, you buy a property and you have to mark off where the property is, that's what dogma is. It's that little lollipop that they stick inside the ground. That's a dogma. And that's what the dogmas are for the church. We don't bash people over the heads with dogmas, but it's the barrier of our faith. It shows what we believe. And so the dogma of iconography came about, right? The teaching of iconography, the doctrine of iconography came about. And the, the basic idea is what I just briefly touched on. And like I said, I'm not going to go too deeply into it, but it's basically what I just touched on. The argument was, well, what are we doing with matter? You know, are we worshipping matter? Are we worshipping paint? Are we worshipping wood? You know, isn't that wrong? Isn't that idolatry? Well, you know, I find it a little bit difficult to believe that anyone would think that we're worshipping wood or something like that. But I'm pretty sure all of you at some point have picked up a photograph of a loved one and you've looked at the photograph and you felt emotion towards that photograph. You're not feeling emotion towards a piece of paper. Everybody knows you're not looking at a piece of paper, but you're looking at the image. You're looking at the icon that's on it. And some people even kiss it. Nobody thinks that you're worshipping <laughs> the thing by kissing it. They know that whatever you do to that icon, you are doing towards the person who is depicted in that icon. Right? But that's material. That's matter. And yet it's instinctive for people to do that. Also, I've seen even Protestants, you know, they'll take a Bible, for instance. And the Bible is just a book. It's just paper again. But they won't put it with other books. Or they won't put it underneath other books. They'll make sure that they keep it on top. Or they'll make sure when they put it on the shelf, they have it in a special place on the shelf. But why? It's just a book. It's just matter. But there's an understanding that there's something holy about that book. There's something different about that book. Right? People do this all the time and they don't realize it. And it's the same thing with icons. Right? Icons are holy, not because of the wood, but because of the magic gold and, you know, that it was, you know, harvested from paint that came from some special island or something like that. No. What makes it holy is the image. For that reason, we have icons that are on prints, printed on paper, and they are miracle working. They have oil streaming from them. They are fragrant because it's the image on them, the icon on them, that makes them holy. So, did people, you know, so this is one of the things they had to establish, that it's not matter that we are venerating. It's not matter by itself. We are uh, not that we're worshipping. We are venerating the matter because it participates in our salvation. St. John of Damascus was one of the big defenders of, uh, of, uh, of iconography during this council, <clears throat> the Seventh Ecumenical Council. And he said, I will never disdain matter because it's by matter that I was saved. And what he meant by that is that God became incarnate. The God who is beyond comprehending, beyond describing, before all time, before all ages, that we cannot see, cannot touch. He became a man. A man that you can see, that you could touch, that lived right here on this planet, in a certain place, in a certain time. And he said, if we deny the holiness of matter and the fact that matter can be sanctified and that matter can participate in our salvation, then we are denying the incarnation completely because that is all about matter. The word incarnation even literally means becoming meat. Carne is meat, right? So incarnation means taking flesh, right? So it doesn't matter if the flesh is, the flesh is wood or if the flesh is flesh. It is all a manifestation of the icon, right? Just as Christ was an icon of the Father, so this is an icon of Christ, right? It's image. Whatever you do to that image, you pass forward, right? Pass forward to whatever, to whoever is depicted on that image. Everyone understands this. Even when they don't think of it, they still understand this instinctively. The other problem is, are we worshipping or are we venerating? Are we worshipping something or are we showing honor towards it? Okay. When I venerate an icon, when I kiss an icon, I'm not, like I said, worshipping the wood. I'm not even worshipping the person depicted on it. I'm venerating, I'm showing honor towards. And again, this is something that should be natural. When you go to the army, well, hopefully you don't have to go to the army, but 
whoever has been in the army, and my dad was in the army, um, you have a certain comportment and a certain respect and a certain way of saluting various officers. You know, that's just how it is. There's a certain behavior that you do. And people don't need to question. Just because an officer comes and you do a certain movement or something like that doesn't mean you're worshiping him. When I stand in front of the icon and I make the sign of the cross and I bow in front of it, doesn't mean I'm worshiping it. I'm showing honor to what is depicted. I'm showing honor to the person who's depicted. An honor that is due in any case because they're much holier than I will ever be. You know? If Christ was standing here right now, would you say, not venerating, or if the mother of God was standing here right now, would you say, I'm not going to bow to you, sorry, you know, you're just a person. Well, hopefully not. <laughs> hopefully we have enough humility that we're able to bow down. This is something I learned by becoming Orthodox, and I'm, I'm a convert to Orthodoxy. And when I first came into the Orthodox Church, there was, a, there was a Russian church back in South Africa, and I saw for the first time people prostrating. It freaked me out. I couldn't believe it. I thought, what is wrong with these people? Why are they doing that? That just made me so uncomfortable, you know, seeing some little Russian old lady down on her knees and then eventually face flat on the floor. I just thought, no, I don't know if I can handle this. <laughs> you know, but that's just because my culture has taught me you don't do those kinds of things. You know, maybe for a soldier, okay, <laughs> that's okay. But, but you simply don't bow down to things like that. You don't, there, there, there's a, such a stigma to an idea of bowing down and worshipping and somehow uh, debasing yourself by showing veneration to something else. This is really something that's foreign to, foreign to orthodoxy. And we should really do well to get rid of it. And for that reason, it's good to practice venerating icons. It's a humble practice to venerate icons. It is humbling to learn how to venerate an icon, to how to pray with an icon, how to have icons in your life. Okay. And like I said, it's not like I walk into my prayer corner and I feel like there's a bunch of blanks floating around me and I'm talking with them. I know they're blanks, I know it's paint. Nevertheless, I stand in the presence of those images. I can take them off, it doesn't mean they're not present anymore. You know, we can stand in a bare church, don't need icons everywhere. <clears throat> but, nevertheless, why wouldn't you want to depict them? Why wouldn't you want them to be there? They're not the be all and end all of everything. We could take all the icons away from the churches and it's not gonna affect the church. You know, the sacraments will continue. But, all we're doing is depriving ourselves of something that comes naturally. Okay. The icon is a natural phenomenon. Right, that's all I'm going to say about the theology because <laughs> we can go on. Anyway, the triumph of this uh, end of iconoclasm is celebrated now in the Orthodox Church. I don't know if we celebrate in the Western Rite like that, but the first Sunday of Orthodoxy, we call it the triumph of Orthodoxy. The triumph of Orthodoxy. We don't call it the triumph of iconography. We call it the triumph of Orthodoxy because the Orthodox theology depended so much on the incarnation. To deny iconography is to deny the incarnation, which means to deny the faith. If you don't want to believe Christ was incarnate, well then, that's fine, but then you, you, why would you be a Christian? Why would you call yourself a Christian if you don't believe Christ was incarnate? <clears throat> so, after iconoclasm, iconography flourishes again. Wonderful. Everything's going very well. I mean, of course, the church has all of its ups and downs and things, but iconography is pretty consistent growing nicely. Some very beautiful masterpieces of iconography being developed from, you know, the, uh, from the 9th century through to, basically through to the Protestant Reformation. Because then suddenly that hits. Right? Protestant Reformation hits. So anything between, basically, the uh, 16th century onwards, things start to get a little bit, a little bit wonky. Right? Particularly in the West, because that's where the Protestant Reformation hit worst. It was influenced, there was an influence towards the East as well, Greece and Russia, Russia especially because they wanted to westernize themselves. But particularly in the West, things started to take a dive. And uh, again, I don't think it's because the Protestants had a problem with the matter, uh, with, with people venerating as such. I think they had a problem with the sacramental dimension that icons can play in our lives, right? Just like the Holy Eucharist is a sacrament, right? And baptism is a sacrament. And these things all participate with matter. It's all matter again that we're using, right? It's bread and wine, it's water. Well, this is also sacramental. I can't call an icon a sacrament, but it's a sacramental dimension to our spiritual life. And I think this was a big problem for Protestantism, to understand this, 
right, to understand the sacramental dimension. And so for that reason, they started to get rid of them, right? And also because of this misunderstanding, perhaps, of uh, thinking that saints are gods. I have some Protestant friends who still say to me, why do you pray to, pray to saints? You know, there's only, there's only one God. I'm like, yeah, I know that. I never said that. <laughs> I never said that St. Peter was God. You know, whoever thought that? But that seems to be the impression they have. So I understand there's this misunderstanding of the veneration of saints and things. But because of that, in the West in particular, we start to see the tradition gets broken. Christ starts to be depicted differently. Right. The style of icons, now I'm going to talk about style in a second, but the style changes a lot. The style starts to adopt the Renaissance look, the naturalist look. And eventually it moves over into modern art and then it's abstracted again. And then eventually Christ is just so totally distorted we actually can't recognize it anymore. The icon has been broken. Right? The tradition has been broken at that point. Now, that's kind of where we were until fairly recently. But in the past... 50 years, 50 to 100 years, orthodoxy, and therefore iconography too, has seen a massive, massive revival, massive revival. And there have been some real pivotal figures in the world of iconography who dug, dug deeper into its past, you know, looked at its roots, looked at uh, ancient uh, you know, masterpieces and frescoes and things like that, and started to understand again what theology is and what part it plays in our, in our um, worship, right, in our Christian lives. And it was kind of like a lot of good came from it and a lot of bad came from it too. A lot of good came from it because we were suddenly rediscovering iconography, which is fantastic. A lot of bad came from it because there was a lot of wishy-washy bad theology that came along with it. And I'll give you some examples. And I mean, many of these things maybe people, you, you guys might even think for yourselves because I was under these same delusions. So for instance, um, well, for instance, you may have heard that an icon can only de be depicted full front, you know, so that you can see his whole face. You can't have an icon where the face is side profile because then there's something, you know, the figure's hiding something. So only Judas should be depicted side profile because he's hiding something. And you see icons where Judas is depicted side profile and nobody else. But then you see icons where St. Peter is also depicted side profile. And you see one where St. Paul is side profile. You know, so where's the theology there? It doesn't make any sense anymore because it's got nothing to do <laughs> with the side profile. The reason you don't see the side profile of an iconography is because it lacks communion with the viewer. The idea of the icon is that it's supposed to commune with you, that if you look at it, it looks at you, right? When you're like this, you can't have that. But it's got nothing to do with theology. It's artistic device, right? Same thing with the, there's these white highlights often in various styles of iconography. I suppose you can see it best. There's these little white highlights, little white highlights around the face in various places. Some people have looked and said, oh, this is the uncreated light. This is the light of holiness shining through the face. Well, I hope I can depict the face as holy, but at the same time, then you see frescoes and they'll paint, uh, you know, Herod, or they'll paint Pontius Pilate, or they'll paint Judas. And he also has those same little highlights. <laughs> so again, well, where's the theology with that? You know, then you get theology of color. Oh, no, this color symbolizes this for sure. And then you get some other context and it's a totally different thing. You know, so where's this theology? It's, it's all just very wishy-washy. So it's great that we've had a revival, but at the same time we've also had to put the brakes on it a little bit and try and actually understand. And the best thing to do was to go back to the Seventh Ecumenical Council and to read what the Father said about what makes an icon. And you know what they said? They said nothing about style. It doesn't matter what style an icon is painted in. If you look at this style, it's very different to this style. It's very different to that style. You know, they're all, I mean, okay, they're all mine, so they're more or less, <laughs> they are more or less similar. It's not such a good example because I painted them all. But in any case, you can look and there's lots of different styles of iconography and not one is more right and not one is less right. The, 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 the father said it must bear the likeness it must look like the figure. So in other words, it must carry through the tradition. Christ have a beard, long hair, right? Not some blonde hair and, you know, whatever, a little moustache that curls out or something. <coughs> brown hair, brown beard, short beard, not a big beard, you know, with, within some variation. It must bear the image, so that's <coughs> And it must bear the name. Okay. 
because again, for a matter of identification, because some saints do, they look really similar, but you always have the name. So you will always see that in every single icon, you will see the image that bears the likeness, and you'll see the name. It has to have the name, the inscription as well, so that you know who it is. Nothing about style. A Renaissance image, you know, a naturalistic image of Jesus, believe it or not, is a perfectly valid icon <laughs> because it bears the image. And if it carries through that tradition that is depicted as Christ, then it's an icon. You might not want to venerate, you might not be you know, familiar with it, you might not want to put it in your church, but it's an icon. There's nothing wrong with it. Right. <clears throat> so it's got nothing to do with style. Orthodoxy, you know, we've been carrying on for 2,000 years over you know, such a huge geographic area. Do you think that there's only one style that's going to be right or that God pleases? <laughs> it's just a multitude, multitude of diversity that pleases God. So the challenges we face today are a lot of just education, really. Um, education in terms of good theology, understanding what the icon is about, and education in terms of painting, because there's unfortunately been a lot of trouble with that. Like I said, the, the, the tradition went through quite a dip, and especially with modernity and uh, you know manufactured paints like acrylic paints and lots of oil paints that you can buy um, the practice of using egg tempera which I'm going to discuss in a second that fell out of use right so the technology of actually using natural materials to create an icon that got lost and I mean I know that from my experience because when I first wanted to start learning iconography I knew nothing about natural pigments and all of that so I just started grabbing whatever paints I could find at the local store and I started painting and I was looking at pictures and books and I was thinking, it just doesn't look the same. Why doesn't it look the same? If you learn correctly, traditionally, how they painted, suddenly you see it looks the same. I'm not saying I'm on the level of <laughs> the masters that I'm comparing with. But you can still see the, the, the similarity. You can see that it's on the right path. And that took some time as well to, to revive. <clears throat> now we're at a really good point. We've got better theology. We've got so many more resources for teaching. There is still a lot of ignorance out there, but we are at least on the right track now, it seems. Um, so that's all you need to know, <laughs> I think, in terms of you know icons, where they are, how they came back, how we use them in church. I'll say a brief word though about, um, because the Western tradition is also very interesting, and I am interested in various things, especially with the iconogra iconographic uh, tradition of the West and how they decorate uh, the churches <clears throat> and I'm not going to go into that too much because I'm more familiar with the, uh, with the Eastern way, with the Greek, basically the Greek way, the Byzantine way of decorating the churches, but I'm just going to briefly run through. So if you ever happen to visit an Orthodox church, a traditional Orthodox church uh, that has frescoes, because that's really the home of the icon, is on the wall in the church, right? Like I said, the icon is supposed to be there for communion. Right? And when you walk into a church and it's full of saints and it's full of angels, even though you're not the only person standing there, you're not alone. You're surrounded always by these heavenly choirs. If you go into a church that has gold mosaic, especially, you know, icons that are made in mosaic, and it's gold mosaic in the background, and it's dark, and you hold a candle, the gold, it, because it's so radiant, it acts like a kind of like a mirror, and the depth disappears and so the figure that's not reflective as the gold comes forward and it seems like you know when you stand in front of the mirror it looks like you can see into the mirror but if you have a sticker or something on the mirror that stays where it is so if you're going to a church that's got those kinds of gold mosaics and then these figures that stand there it's as if the walls disappear and the figures remain and then they are all surrounding with you in the church and you go into those other churches and they have dark blue background it's so that in the dark, that dark blue disappears and the figures stand forward because they are all with us participating in worship. That's the natural home for the icon. Now we have portable icons and things we take into our homes, but the real place for an icon is within the church building because that is the place of communion par excellence where you meet God. Right? That is really where God is made manifest. That's where God and His saints are made manifest. When I'm standing there in front of that little piece of bread and wine, <laughs> it's a little piece of bread and wine, but I can see the saints, I can see the angels, I can see everyone before me, after me, is all gathered around this bread and wine. Everyone is there in the church. Right? This is what the icons are depicting, this is what they are manifesting. 
And so if you ever do happen to walk into an Orthodox church like that, traditional Orthodox church, and very briefly, you'll see a dome. Normally they've got a very big dome. Inside this very big dome, you'll see Christ. They call him Pantokrat, that means the ruler of all, or almighty, right? At the top, because you can't get higher than Christ, right? <laughs> He's at the top. And the dome is a very beautiful, gentle shape, unlike a spire. It's a gentle shape, which Christ is covering. Christ is coming down. Christ is sheltering, right? <clears throat> this is what a beautiful dome is. Then below him, you'll have angels, who are the closest beings that fly around God. Then you see I've got one guy who's yawning. <laughs> it's okay, I can tell. I'm reading. This one's okay. I'm speeding it up. <laughs> um, then you have the angels, right? Then the next thing's down from Christ. Then you have the Old Testament prophets, because they're the ones who came before us and laid the groundwork for the New Testament, for the Gospel, right? Then you'll have underneath that, well, sometimes you'll have like a scenes of the liturgy. Otherwise, you'll have the apostles, who are the continuous, right? The continuation of the prophets, of the Old Testament prophets. You'll have the apostles. And then below that, on the walls, you'll have the saints who stand down amongst us, who are with us, right? That's how the, you'll see these sort of tears that go down. And then, okay, depending on how complicated the church is, you know, what you have... For, you have side chapels and things there might be different things but generally that's what you'll see coming from the top and then going down to the walls and then the altar you know normally the altar is just sort of curved it's not flat like this it's like an apse and there you'll see the image of the mother of god right <clears throat> the platitera it's called the more spacious than the heavens and she's holding christ she's holding sort of a christ in her well where her womb would be you could say because it's in the altar in the sanctuary where he's made manifest right where he has given birth Often you'll see on either side, you'll see the Annunciation icon, so Archangel Gabriel telling the Virgin Mary on that side that you will conceive, because what's happening in between is <laughs> the conception, right? Then Christ is there in between, in the altar. There's all sorts of just little uh, devices and things like that to try and explain what, what's the understanding of, uh, you know, what's going on in the church, where we're putting these things. I can't go into it too much because... It's complicated and it would be better if we were actually standing in an Orthodox church and I could point things out and show you. But anyway, I'm going to give you a very, very brief break, uh, breakdown on what actually goes into painting an icon. Because, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's unfortunate because we live in a day of mass production. Things are cheap, but things are also cheap in the sense that they don't last long. They, they're tacky. They, they don't have the same beautiful handcrafted nature that things did before. When things are handcrafted, first of all, they should be better quality, they should last. But there's something beautiful about the, the work of a human hand that you just simply cannot, you cannot replace, a machine cannot replace. Unfortunately, and I mean, I'm not saying, like I said, it's not that a printed icon is you know, any less of an icon than a hand-painted one. But unfortunately, it's done damage to the trade of Orthodox iconography because it's, people don't understand or appreciate handcrafting. It's so much easier to just buy a print. You know, instead of commissioning me, myself commissioning me, <laughs> commissioning myself to paint some masterpiece, you know, I've seen this beautiful icon of, you know, whatever, Pancelinos from, you know, 13th century, please can you paint it? It's so much easier for me just to go buy a print because, first of all, it'll be better than what I can do, the, you know, the actual icon, it's the original, and it's much cheaper. And so when you people commission an icon and you actually tell them, well, this is how much it costs, most of them fall over backwards because they think, oh my goodness, well, why would it be so expensive? I can just get a print. And I'll, I'll explain to you why icons cost a lot in the end and why it's also a very limited thing. I mean, if I had known how, well, actually, I think my dad did warn me, but, you know, if I'd known what a terrible career this is, <laughs> I probably would not have pursued this as a career. It's worse than being a normal artist. You know, I'd rather be a secular artist. You've got more chance of survival than being an iconographer. <laughs> no, but you know, thank God I still, I still am able to make some kind of a living. But uh, so let me show you. Let me give you an example. I'll use, I'll use this tool. So, so first of all, the board. Right? This is a traditional icon board. I'll pass it around to you in a second. It's a traditional icon board. Okay. It's just wood. Right? Normally it's linden or lime wood because it ages well. On the back, it's two braces, sometimes of a stronger type, to stop it from 
warping because all work over time warps. That's just to delay it. There's also a nifty little bit of craftsmanship here. You can't see it so nicely on this one because it's small. But you see how the dovetail joint here is bigger on this side than it is on this side. And the same thing on that side is different because as the wood moves, this is starting to get a little bit loose and you need to tighten it up so that the wood can stay in place. And because it's tapered, it's got a tapered shape, you just hammer it in and it tightens the board up again. It's just a little thing, but it's ingenious. <laughs> you know, and anyone who's really into you know, woodwork and craftsmanship or whatever can appreciate the dovetail fitting like that. I've never been able to do that very well. But these boards are very nice. The next thing is this recess, this carved recess. Again, the icon does not need to have a recess. It's not any less of an icon because it doesn't have this. I'm just talking about the traditional method, right? You have this recess. They call that in Russian a kovchek. I can't remember what it is in Greek. Kovchek actually just means arc. But again, let's not get too symbolic about it and everything. The arc just means that it gives this... Uh, it's the icon's ingenious answer to a frame, let's say. It gives the icon a space to dwell in. Like a visual field to start dwell in. Icons don't need to be framed. You can frame an icon. Who cares? You want to frame an icon, you can frame an icon. But an icon basically has its frame built into it. Okay. <clears throat> but especially it gives the icon a nice dwelling place. All right? The image a nice dwelling place. Then, that's all nice. But you don't just paint directly onto the wood. No, you have to prepare the wood correctly. You have to stick with rabbit skin glue. Okay, or some kind of glue, natural glue. You have to stick a cloth over it. Then on top of that, you have to mix marble dust with that same rabbit skin glue and you make this thing called gesso. Gesso is like a really white, pasty type of uh, substance. And you paint that on there. Then you leave that to dry. Then you sand it. And it has to be sanded so smooth it's like glass. Because if you start to put gold on something that's bumpy, because gold is so reflective, you'll see it immediately. If there's the slightest, slightest uh, bump or dimple or whatever scratch, you'll see it immediately with glass, uh, with gold. So it has to be sanded down smooth, smooth, smooth. Okay, now your board is ready for painting. So that's just the board. <laughs> now boards, I used to make them myself, like that board I made, that St. Nicholas over there, I made that board myself. I don't have the facilities to make them anymore. Oh, this board I made myself. This was made to see myself in South Africa. Um, you can pass this around, by the way. Um, that's just the board. Then we're going to get into the painting. Okay. First of all, it takes many years to develop the skill to be able to do that. That already is years of, of uh, training that you end up paying for. Natural pigments, all right, like Father Cyprian said in the introduction. We use natural pigments, which means basically pigments, most of it comes from various earth products, but some of it can come from other things like they have certain greens and things from oxidizing copper, for instance. So you get these natural pigments, all right? You grind them up to very, very fine powders so that you can make them paint. And you mix them with egg yolk, right, which is also prepared in a certain way. That's your paint. Then you start painting. Right? Like I said, all the skill, all the various techniques. I can't explain all of that. That's much too complicated. But you paint your icon. Okay, very happy with it now. That's lovely. But well, it's not finished. <laughs> you have to put the varnish on afterwards because icons get touched a lot. Icons get dropped a lot. <laughs> Hopefully not, you know, but they do, they get handled a lot. That's why the icons that we have are largely, you know, in the state that they are, because in the Orthodox Church we love matter, we touch things, we smell things, we kiss things. Okay, so it has to be protected, which means it has to have a varnish. But again, staying true to the tradition and trying to maintain a, a high level of uh, um, uh, craftsmanship and natural products, you don't just go and use whatever varnish you can, although there are some very good varnishes these days, but we use traditional things like oil, um, a type of oil that's been treated that it can dry in a certain way, or, or oil that's been mixed with um, resin, like uh, I think this one was done with copal. Copal is a resin that comes from a tree in West Africa. The resin is, you know, like the sap, it comes out of the tree, you take it, it dries into a type of crystal, crystal, you dissolve that in oil or in turpentine, and then you wipe, uh, you know, you paint that onto the dry icon. The turpentine disappears, or the oil dries, and the resin stays on it, right? So now it's covered with that. What's basically the tree sap has now protected that layer of paint. Okay. 
then you should leave it to dry for one year. <laughs> one year. When people come and they commission an icon, I can't say to them, yeah, one year, you know, well, I'll get around to it in a month and then I'll give it to you in one year. No, of course not. People want things sooner. But traditionally speaking, and if we had time, like our forefathers did, I don't know why we're in such a rush with everything these days, but you would actually wait that long. In fact, you would actually wait that long before you varnish. Okay, you can take, pass that one around as well if you want to take a look. Okay. That's, that's all of that without gold. Right. Then we'll talk briefly about gold. Gold is not gold paint. Many people just think, oh, let's just use the gold paint. There's no such thing as gold paint. Right? This is gold leaf, which is literally a tiny little nugget of pure gold that they hammer and hammer and hammer until it's a, a flat, flat, tiny little leaf that if you breathe too hard, it will go flying away. <clears throat> and you prepare the gold, the, the board, like I said, you sand it smooth. And then there's various different techniques of how to, uh, how to uh, put the gold on. But in any case, you pick up that tiny little, very thin leaf and you lay it on, like I said, in different ways. So what's actually gold there is real gold. Okay, it's a thin layer, but you can sometimes do two, three, four, five layers if you want. It's just, the money is just flying out the window when you do that. <laughs> but, but in any case, that's what you're paying for, is gold. A pack of, uh, a little pack of gold like this, okay, for 25 sheets, 25 sheets. This, this was, I mean, I don't know, I must have used about five sheets or something like that. About five sheets, I suppose, maybe more. It's 50 pounds. 50 pounds for a little pack like this with 25 sheets of gold. Okay. That's gold. <clears throat> one way of laying gold. There's lots of other ways. So, I mean, you can see how much gold is on that one. The price goes up. Then, um, the last thing, this one. This one is not egg. This is wax. This is another thing that I do. This is painted in hot wax, which is even more durable than the egg. Because we have icons, well, we have paintings and icons from, you know, the early centuries. Some, some of these paintings we have were about 2,000 years old, made in wax. And they're as fresh as the day that they were made. Because wax is such a stable substance. Wax just sits. It doesn't alter, you know, it doesn't alter, it doesn't change, it just sits there. Egg eventually will, <clears throat> over time, break down. I mean, you know, over time as in, you know. 800, 900,000 years, not, not like within our lifetimes or our children's lifetimes. <clears throat> but wax is even longer than that. Wax is even more stable than that. So that's a whole other thing. You know? and then I mix pigments into hot wax. And I mix various types of oils into that wax to make it more paintable. And I paint with it hot because uh, you know, it just has a particular texture that you could feel in the cycle when you pass it around. And you can imagine like when you have a candle, as soon as you take the wax, it's liquid. As soon as you take that wax away, it just solidifies. So you can imagine to paint, you have to be very quick, <laughs> very hot, because you have to paint like this quickly. But like I said, I mean, I'm just saying why, I'm just explaining why things cost a lot. It's not essential that you have an icon made out of wax. But just to give you an idea of the amount of work and the amount of training and the amount of skill that goes into making good quality, actual, real icons, you can get print. And you can get an iconographer who's less experienced to paint you an icon. And like I said, I cannot deny at all that these are not icons. You know, I've seen some hideous icons. But I would never deny that they are not an icon. <laughs> they are icons. But this is why good quality work uh, costs so much. So what I would like to see now, I mean, I'm gonna, I can do a few cute questions and answers in a second, but what I want to see personally, the future for iconography, is a revival of this understanding and the quality of craftsmanship <coughs> all around, you know, I, not just within the Orthodox churches, but even, you know, I've seen Catholic people becoming more interested. I've even seen Protestant people becoming more interested in holy images. And there's such an opportunity for us now to embrace this in our spiritual lives. He's yawning again. This is <laughs> to, <laughs> to embrace this in our spiritual lives, right? To make this a part of us, to reclaim it. Because it always was a part of us. And why would we deny ourselves something that is beautiful and natural that we should have in our, uh, in our spiritual lives amongst us? This, the, the, the ground is set. The stage is set. Everything is ready for us to actually start to participate more with icons in our lives, icons in our worship. Okay. So that's 
as broad as I can get without getting too crazy into it, without making him yawn a third time. Okay. <laughs> anyway, so any questions or answers? On, I mean, questions, and I'll give you the answers. Could you comment on the relationship between the holiness Yeah. Preparations before you, uh, well, I can tell you certainly that you can be the most profane sinner in the world and still paint an icon because I paint icons. <laughs> and, and I'm certainly not the, I'm not the most saintly person. No, <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> the thing is, icons do come down a lot to skill. That's true. A lot of it depends on the skill of the icon. The quality of the icon is going to be dependent on the skill of the iconographer, the technical skill. However, yes, I think there is a spiritual dimension that is dependent on the spiritual life of the painter. We have some very beautiful icons that, you know, for instance, Saint Andre Rublev, he's always been considered a saint. He was only canonized in the last century or whatever, but he has always been considered a saint, this iconographer, because his icons are so saintly. It's just, it's impossible to imagine that they were made by somebody who wasn't living a deep, deep, deep spiritual life. <clears throat> and I think, like I said, you could paint, you could just be, you know, I could be a Buddhist and I could learn how to paint icons. But I'm not participating in it and I'm not putting myself in it because I'm not living it. You know, when I paint icons, <clears throat> and I'm blessed that that's my profession basically, I mean, I do some other work, bits, bits and pieces to make ends meet. But I'm very blessed that I can stay in my studio where I'm surrounded by icons all the time. I'm blessed that I'm a priest so that, you know, when I'm not painting icons, I'm priesting. <laughs> and everything is, for me is just a big submersive experience in this world of orthodoxy and particularly around the world of iconography. So <clears throat> I, think, I think it's a very relevant question. How much of that affects your work? Yeah, if it, depends on, it depends on how much you're immersing yourself in. I can learn how to paint all sorts of things, but if I'm not participating in it, like a, the Buddhist example is a good idea. I could paint Buddhist mandalas, very beautiful, nice. I could do Tibetan drawings, very nice. But I'm not participating in that tradition. I'm not living that spirituality, so it would be empty. It might be a pretty picture, but it would be empty ultimately. Nevertheless, on the other hand, even if you know a Buddhist painted an icon, I could still take that icon and I could still make it holy by my praise, you know, because ultimately it's the image that makes it holy. But there is something to say about the holiness of the iconographer. Anything else? In a, in a Catholic church, if you saw an image of a saint, there would very often be, so if you had Saint Lucy, there would be eyes, or Catherine Alexandria, there's always a, some representation of a wheel. Yeah. In um, Orthodox iconography, we don't really see that, mm. and is that just because it's redundant because the name of the saint is already there, or is, it, is there a deep reason why we wouldn't no, do that? No, it's just, I think it's just a variation in, in look, it, it, we do have it in orthodoxy, we just have it less <clears throat> than what you have in the Catholic Church, and I think it's just a, very, a difference in culture, really, and tradition. Um, we call those, like, like you said, you know, the Catherine and the wheel, and, uh, you know, Joseph was carrying a lily and things like that. That's the attributes, and it does identify. It is easy, easier to identify the saint because you say, oh, so-and-so always carries this. It does exist within orthodoxy. It's just less so. But ultimately, it's not the attribute that they're carrying or they're wearing or something that identifies them. It's, it's the name. In orthodoxy, it's a little bit more broad. Like, you can tell a bishop. Say, oh, he's a bishop. You know, but you wouldn't know which bishop he is until you read the name. You know, whereas with the Catholics, it might be a little bit more specific because of the attributes. Or, or a good example is St. Peter. You know, St. Peter often in the Catholic Church is holding his keys. And you can tell, oh, that's St. Peter because he's holding the keys. Orthodox churches, you don't often see St. Peter hold the keys. But you know it's Peter because it looks like Peter, and it says Peter. You know, so, yeah, it does exist, just, just less so. <coughs> On the back of that, I believe in, well, in Western Orthodox iconography, martyrs are often depicted carrying the palms, palms. while in Byzantine they, 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 they carry the cross of Christ. Yes, exactly. They? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, just the same thing. They're totally valid either way, just different different traditions. You know. It's, you know, we don't have time to talk about all of that now, but I very much love the Western iconographic tradition because what people have ignored a lot is that for a good over a thousand years, 
there was a strong, strong iconographic tradition in the West, and it just died eventually, you know, due to uh, various circumstances, mostly Protestant uh, Reformation. But uh, this, this, they had a beautiful, wild imagination <laughs> of iconography that you actually don't really see very much in the East. If you had to compare them, the East is really quite boring, actually. The Greeks are really quite boring compared to what was going on in the West. The West, the artists were just so free. Now, if you look at the cathedrals and you look at some of these beautiful manuscripts and things, maybe sometimes a little bit too free. But, uh, but still, there was a very strong, rich iconographic tradition, which can be revived. You know, we can't just copy it. We have to live it again. And if we start to live it again, it revives itself. But that depends on us. That depends on our education, our participation in the life, the fullness of the life of the church. I've woken up my dance. No good. <laughs> um, yeah, so I've always had a strict iconographic tradition of Eastern Orthodoxy. Um, since an icon is understood as a window into heaven, um, saints aren't uh, depicted with any evidence of only the infirmities of their earthly life, and then there was no resurrected body, which is um, depicted on the heavenly body, which is probably the, the best word. Mm. Um, but I have seen, especially when I was looking into icons of contemporary saints like um, Mother Maria Spotswell, for example, mm. that there was a kind of variation. There were lots of icons. Kind of, you could tell that um, the iconographer clearly wanted it to be familiar, as you know, the, the little Russian lady lived in Paris, so she got glasses. And um, I just wondered how much flexibility there is within the Eastern Orthodox kind of iconographic tradition, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, whether that's like a super strict rule or if it's kind of yeah, that, it's, that's a good question. It's a relevant, very relevant topic for um, contemporary iconographers. Um, so, so first of all, there's two things there. First of all, the, there's, there's, there's this, like I only gave an example of that bad theology that slowly kind of tries to creep in in various places. One of the examples of this bad theology is the idea that the image of the icon is the perfected image of the person. So they don't have any blemishes or whatever. They're in heaven and they're saintly and everything's perfect. Well, what is perfect then? Shouldn't we all be like in our late twenties and in our prime and just really good looking and strong? You know, why, why are some of these saints all old? You know, I mean, why would they be old? Why, why are some of the saints you see, like um, Saint Modestus, for instance, his jaw was, you know, he was uh, beaten so badly his jaw couldn't close anymore, and he had to tie it up with a bandage. You see that in the icons, you know. Why do you see Saint John the Baptist with his head in his hand? You know, shouldn't they all? Uh, Saint Matrona. Is we here with her eyes closed? Yes, yeah. exactly. Who is born without eyes? Yeah, you know, and it's a debate because sometimes people have said, "Oh no, you shouldn't do that. You should give her eyes." Then you know, or like uh, Saint Maria Scorzova, um, no, no, we can't depict her with glasses because uh, you know that's an ailment, and in heaven there are no ailments. Well, where do you draw the line? Where where do you draw the line with that kind of understanding? Um, rather. And I mean, somebody explained it to me like this, and I thought that was quite good, because we have icons of Christ, for instance, right? The resurrected Christ. But he wears his wounds, right? He has his uh, mm -hmm. wounds of the cross. And you say, well, if he's resurrected and he's perfected, why does he have the wounds still then? And uh, this other guy explained it to me, and he said, well, whatever was a part of their salvation, whatever made them a part of who they were, whatever served spiritual purpose in their lives, that can be depicted because it's part of what made them who they are. So an elderly saint, all those years of him being alive, <laughs> that's what perfected him. You know, uh, Saint, saint uh, Matrona, part of her holiness came from the challenge of not having eyes. That was, the, that was her struggle in life, you know, that she had to learn to live with that. Saint Maria, she had glasses. Did that really affect her salvation or not? Did that really make you know make her a better or worse spiritual person? If not, then take them off because often glasses uh, again problem of communion. You know, it's not easy in an icon to have communion with the person if they're wearing glasses. I mean, there are very good icons of like Saint Luke or Saint uh, Maria that are wearing glasses, but generally speaking, you'll see they take them off because it's easier to have communion without without the glasses. Um, but in any case, the reason they can take it off is because the glasses didn't relate to their salvation. Right? I think that's the best, that's the best answer I've, I've received in any case. But, oh, and sorry, and the other, the other thing, 
that man wants to get going. Um, <laughs> okay. um, the other thing was that, uh, yes, the challenge we face today with photographs and contemporary saints. <clears throat> People want their saint, and you know, we have a photo of St. John of Shanghai in San Francisco, for argument's sake, but they want it as an icon. So, okay, you know, I'll make it Byzantine or iconographic style, but it still has to look like him at the same time. This is, this is just a, a challenge that the artist has to go through because it's easy if I just gave you a photograph or if I just copied the photograph or I made a naturalistic painting. But to try and iconicize it, you know, iconalize it, whatever, turn it into an icon, it is a bit of a challenge. And, uh, and um, yeah, what can I say? There's not much to say about that other than you try to make the client happy. <laughs> you really try and have they look at it and they say, oh, that looks exactly like the saint. Because I've had it a few times and they say, oh, that doesn't look anything like it. You know, so, well. You know, that's also why you have the name. <laughs> that's why the name is there. But anyway, yeah. Okay. No, that's it. Good. I would like to give an enormous thank you to Father Justin for travelling all this way and for enlightening us with some of his wisdom and his knowledge and his experience within the world of iconography. Um, I've been Orthodox for longer than I care to admit these days, um, and there's something about the experience of worshipping and praying with icons, day by day, week by week, that still doesn't give us the background that we've been privileged to have this evening. One of the points that Father Justin made was about Western iconography and this rich tradition and, and how there is the scope for reviving that. That was actually attempted by one of our saints, Saint John of Saint-Denis, who is depicted here. He is the saint who is responsible, a Russian saint, but who fell in love with the Western rites and he restored that form of Vespers that we use this evening was his work, um, based on ancient Gallican sources. And his brother worked on restoring ancient Gregorian chants and harmonising them. But one of the other things that they did was work on the iconographic mm. tradition. And I would like to give to you as a thank you for coming to us a collection of the work of St. John of Saint Denis oh, in his attempt of restoring the Western iconographic tradition. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>